uh, the Rwandan Foreign Minister, Honorable Louise Mushikiwabo. Um, and before I explain to you who she is, I'll just remind the Minister and the High Commissioner, Yamina, congratulations on that appointment. Um, that we, we've met quite some time ago, actually, by the pool at the Sankara. And I've been looking to invite uh, the Honorable Minister for quite some time. And in particular because uh, I, I was keen because she's such a senior, the most senior, most woman in the East African community that I'm aware of. So it's a real privilege uh, to have you here today. Um, obviously there's been a lot of uh, interest and excitement and uh, I, I think it'll be a great place for you to put your case and the case for the Rwanda government uh, out there. The Honorable Louise Mushikiwabo is the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of the Republic of Rwanda. She previously served as the Minister of Information in the Government of Rwanda. She is an author, a public relations executive, lived in the United States for 22 years, um, then briefly in Tunisia before joining the Rwandan Cabinet in March 2008. She is the co-author of Rwanda Means the Universe, um, an intergenerational socio-historical memoir, and has con contributed many articles to newspapers and online magazines. She's given numerous television and radio talks on Rwandan issues and collaborated on many award-winning documentary films. She is also the recipient of the 2004 Outstanding Humanitarian Award from America's University uh, School of International Studies and holds languages and interpretation degrees from the University of Delaware. So it's a real privilege, uh, Madam Minister, to host you today. We are all excited to hear what you've got to say and uh, I'm not going to take the podium up anymore and I'm going to hand it over to you. Madam Louise Mushikiwabo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ali Khan. And I'm very, very happy to be here. I like, uh, I like Nairobi. It's one of my favorite cities around the continent. And I, I tend to get along with Kenyans better than uh, many other people. I like the energy and the uh, fearlessness and the openness uh, of Kenyans. So it is really a pleasure for me to um, to be discussing with you this morning. I want to thank um, Ali Khan and our High Commissioner Yamina Karitani for organizing this. I think this kind of forum um, is needed in more than uh, Nairobi. We, we need to get ourselves talking more. We need to share ideas and we need to um, anticipate and look forward on important issues that uh, face our countries. So as I speak to you this morning and uh, with great pleasure take your questions, I will be talking to you as a Rwandan but uh, very much as an East African and more importantly as an African. So I take that perspective as we discuss uh, this morning. And of course I, I will uh, privilege the Q&A but I wanted to, to make a few points uh, fitting in the times we are in, both my own country but the continent um, in general and look forward to uh, answering questions and hear what you also have to say. So thank you very much again, uh, Ali Khan. Um, as, as we all see, the many countries on the continent have been celebrating 50 years of independence. Uh, since last year, we have been uh, to many African capitals um, celebrating and, and enjoying the importance of 
being an independent country, my own noted the occasion on July 1st, not, not long ago, 50 years of independence. And for Rwandans, we thought it was important to um, celebrate. 50 years is not nothing, and independence is not something that should be taken lightly. But we thought it was important also as a nation to look back, to understand and take note of what uh, our nation had become, what our nation went through, and especially, I think, through debates at all levels, um, at uh, the level of uh, the leaders of the country, the citizens, the academics, uh, civil society, talk about where we were going as a nation. So our 50 years of independence in Rwanda were marked more by debate and discussion, uh, and of course, uh, some level of uh, celebration. So these 50 years of independence uh, for Rwanda also mark 50 years of membership in the United Nations. On September 18th this year, Rwanda will be 50 years old in the United Nations system. And it's a legacy that is um, mixed, to say the least. Um, so as we look at how things have played out in the past uh, few days and few weeks, uh, particularly with the situation of uh, instability in Eastern DRC, right at the borders of Rwanda, this begs the question of where have we been in the last 50 years, really? So we look at the relationships between ourselves Africans and our partners and our friends around the world and we look at which is actually more important how we Africans, Rwandans, Congolese, Kenyans how we feel about ourselves what do we want how do we want to be treated are we sitting back being examined by the world or even when that happens, do we also say what we think? Do we want to share? Do we believe we have a say in what happens to ourselves um, and our countries? And that's really a very important question. As today Africans, Rwandans, struggle to make a living, to make a good living, as we try to fit within um, our region, the East African community, for example, the global community, how do we as Africans want to define ourselves? What are we ready to accept? What are we not ready to accept? How do we conduct a dialogue with the rest of the world? And this is something I very much uh, want to exchange uh, with you and, and hear from you on as, as we, we discuss uh, this morning. And I want to insist on this because the consequences of how Africa talks to Africa and the perception of Africa in the world very much has to do with whether we matter, whether we are present, or whether we think the world will turn around us and we will just fit in. Um, a, concerning this particular situation of uh, crisis in Eastern DRC, which has sucked in uh, Rwanda, I will come back to the specifics um, in a moment. But one thing uh, that the average Rwandan is wondering, how did my country even get into this? Why is it that it is my president who's being asked to fix Congo? Why is it that the international community, whatever that means, decides that Eastern Congo is actually Rwanda? Why is it that Congolese of Rwandan descent 
are not treated as Congolese citizens, and that is fine, because that is what we are observing uh, from Rwanda. As we integrate within this community five countries and more applying today, what is it that the rest of the world is thinking about our countries getting together? Why can't a Congolese of Rwandan descent be a full citizen, not a second class citizen? Why can't whatever tribe in whatever African country, whatever ethnic group, feel that they fully belong to their own countries? And why is it in, in the particular case of Rwanda that especially after the genocide, as Rwandans tried to run away for the dark part of their history, the rest of the world wants to bring them back where they're trying to run away from. And so as we define ourselves as Rwandans, most outsiders, people from away from this continent, and sometimes people from this continent, want to know whether we are Twa, Hutu, or Tutsi when we are saying this history was painful to our country and we have decided that we are Rwandan, we're not denying who we really are, our families, our clans, uh, the makeup of any African society today, but please allow us to be Rwandan. And this definition of ourselves by others is something that affects many, many Africans. When we look at the situation in Ivory Coast, for example, who's Ivorian, who's Burkinabe, who's Malian? When we look at um, uh, our own neighborhood, what Tanzanian actually has parents in Kenya or Rwanda or Uganda? And why should that matter? And what is it that is going to get us, Africans, all of us, to actually debate these issues and make up our minds as to who we are, who we want to be known as, and how ultimately we go to achieve many things for our countries and take a stand as ourselves. This in no way is um, to excuse what we do wrong because there is plenty wrong with what we do. Just as there is a lot of uh, bad moves and wrong with other parts of the world. Who is it that is going to come from this continent to tell the people that are teaching us lessons what they are doing wrong and why can't we talk about it? Whether we accept it, whether we reject it, can we talk about it? So I wanted this morning to remind us of how far we have come, how far have we come, and as we struggle in our daily lives to make um, a living and to improve our lives, it is important because Africa has a history and it has a history that is very particular and therefore we cannot forget where we have come from and especially how far we have come from. Um, the events in, in Rwanda in particular in these last uh, few weeks have given us uh, a lot of food for thought and at some point we started thinking that we are in 1812 and not 2012. Um, and yet, as I said, many of us, many of our countries have been enjoying um, and celebrating 50 years of independence. It is critical, many Rwandans think today, to reject, to run away from the picture of the African forced into the role of supplicant, a child begging for approval from a stern but very compassionate parent, a Western government official sitting in a room in Brussels or Washington or Paris, thousands of miles away from 
uh, Africa, briefing a Western journalist, sharing stories about us Africans, creating a narrative. And we Africans are not expected to question at all that narrative because it is made in the West, making fateful decisions sometimes that will impact on us, not on them, and not being allowed, not being able to talk about it, reject it, make a decision, or even debate it. So how far have we come as Africans? How far as have we come when international uh, agencies, NGOs, feel free and entitled to treat us the way they want to treat us? And how far have we come when even among ourselves, some of us find cause to join that definition of Africa by the West and even cause for celebration when our neighbors are treated in that way. Critics of the Rwandan government, the so-called activists and agitators, Twitter personalities, self-styled journalists, Africans, all of them, watch, watch them, uh, especially in the last few weeks, where this narrative has been uh, created of Rwanda being the villain that is causing trouble in the neighborhood. Watch how the definition of Rwanda as a villain has gone viral. I was reading uh, a number of uh, articles last night, one after the other, and I can't recognize my own country. What I read and what I see is not what Rwandans see, it's not what Rwandans feel, but this is the kind of world I was, I was trying to, to describe. And perhaps the most undignified spectacle of the past few days has been the sad reminder that so many Africans still assess their own worthiness based on what outsiders think of them or say. And it is Rwanda's position and thinking as a nation that has been rebuilding itself in the last 18 years, that there is no amount of approval by the outside that is going to make you who you are. That approval can come, it can go. So as far as we have come, it is imperative that we define ourselves that we debate those who define us, and importantly, that we refuse to be treated as an indolent child waiting for the approval of an unhappy parent. And I think all Africans should find cause for concern. I'm being deliberately provocative because I think these are issues that we need to talk about as Africans so that we can preserve who we are, our lifestyles, our traditions, so that we can blend in this global world, and especially so that we can matter as individuals and ultimately as a, as a continent. It is Rwanda today. It was another country yesterday. It could be any other country tomorrow. But Rwanda does not want to be left alone. We want to engage and we want to be active in our region, on our continent, and in the wider world. We are determined to take full advantage of the modern globalized economy. If we make mistakes, which we do, we are happy to have for our friends to tell us. If we disagree, we are happy to have a debate. And if we disagree totally, we are happy to part agreeing that we disagree. But we will not accept to be treated as children. We will not take the role of a child fighting for a parent's affection. And we insist on our dignity, on our African dignity. 
We welcome alliances, but we aspire for equality in those relationships because that is the prerequisite for dignity. And dignity is not a word Africans can afford to play with. We also understand that to be treated as equal, we must attain um, a level of self-sufficiency, both political, but also, and more importantly, economic. And as long as countries and international agencies can wave checkbooks over our heads, we will never be equal. That is what motivates Rwanda's national agenda. We call it Vision 2020. And we, when we reach 2020, we will go to the next vision. And that is why we have instituted policies and programs over the past 10 years that have delivered sustained high levels of economic growth, even in the midst of the Great Recession. It is why we have managed to help one million Rwandans in five years to escape poverty. That is the foundation of our child and maternal mortality rates dropping by 41% and 35% respectively since 2006. That is why key indicators of pro progress, the fertility rate, for example, has dropped to 4.6 from 6.1, largely as a result of a rapid and widespread adoption of modern contraceptive methods. That is why primary school enrollments in Rwanda stand at more than 90%, with the numbers attending secondary school having doubled. And that is why Rwandans today, 96 of them have health care. So we are going in the direction of a better life, and we don't want anything to stop us. We have to preserve our ambition as a nation. We have to preserve stability as a country and a region. And we have to fit in the global world. We have to have a say as a country, as a region, as a continent. So that said, we still have a long way to go. We, we still um, are facing poverty our economic infrastructure in Rwanda particularly with respect to energy lags far behind our ambitions. We need a lot more investment in the private sector. Perhaps we can learn a bit more from this country, Kenya, on the private sector as a major driver of the economy. Um, those economic ambitions, that self-definition that dignity of a nation, of a continent, is what my country is all about uh, today. We know for a fact that we share it with many in this country, in this region, and it is that combination of being who you are, fitting in your region, fitting in your world, improving your life, that brings us to work every morning. It is also for, for that reason and in that perspective that our exchanges as East Africans, as Africans, are more and more urgent, particularly from our young people. So I will stop here and uh, welcome uh, your questions and an exchange with you this morning. And I thank you very, very much. Thank you very much uh, for that very powerful uh, state uh, uh, speech, uh, Madam Minister. If I can just, uh, I was a bit remiss, and uh, the High Commissioner of uh, Rwanda has kindly bailed me out. So if I can just say a couple of thank yous uh, if, uh, to people in the room. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the um, presence of the Australian, Mozambique, Congo uh, uh, ambassadors, and the Uganda Deputy Ambassador, and also my, my new friend Gabriel, who is the AFDB's Regional Director in the region, amongst many other people. Now, yes, 
the UN had to, and, and uh, sorry, I've, I've missed one more, two more things. I would also like to uh, uh, recognize the uh, presence of the UN Habitat here as well. Thank you. And the fact that uh, we are actually transmitting live on Rwanda TV as well. So it shows what a flat world it is these days that uh, we can do that. Um, I know we're going to, Madam Minister, we're going to have a lot of questions, obviously. Uh, so I think we should uh, go for that uh, straight away. And who has the mics in the room? Great. Uh, do we just have one over there? Or we got two? You got two? Um, Nishat, will you ha help out? Maybe we can have one person on this side, so then... Can I take any questions for the um, uh, Madam Minister, or shall I start with my question? Madam Minister, we're watching things like Syria, we're watching all these sort of places, and I saw on the news that the UN is deploying heli helicopter gunships in eastern DRC. Um, my first question would be, do you think that is an appropriate response in the context of the situation that we are in at the moment? Uh, to, to the to the current, do you think it's it it will, it, it, it is uh, illegal, and do you think it, it, it's it's overcooked, or what would you how would you characterize the UN's intervention right now in the Eastern DRC? Thank you. I think um, the UN mission in the Congo is to stabilize Congo. Uh, the S in MONUSCO stands for stabilization. So I'm not sure what it takes to stabilize Congo. But what I know for a fact is that shooting at mutinies or the population, depending, um, is not the way to stabilize. Now, what I wonder is this mission has been in the Congo for the last 13 years, 20,000 men, $1.3 billion a year, the region is as unstable, if not more, as it was when the, the force arrived. Why wait this long to start shooting? Why not do it many, many years ago so we don't end up with so many other groups, armed groups and rebellions and mutinies and so forth? So the question really, um, to me, is not so much whether it's legal or not, you know, uh, what's legal in one part of the world is not necessarily legal in another part, in another part of the world. But um, the question is, why is it so easy to do certain things in our part of the world and very, very difficult uh, in other parts of the world? Why is it that that same ease of mandate and, and that permissive a political environment is not there in Syria, for example. I'm assuming there are more Syrians dying every day than in Eastern Congo. So, and I think to be very undiplomatic, um, there is a lot of uh, mixed interest interests. Uh, there is also confusion, and that is why I think what we have seen in the Congo in the last uh, two and a half months is more confusion than solutions. So um, perhaps the UN mission is justified, I'm not sure. Uh, but the question is, can we have peace and stability in Eastern Congo? Thank you. Can I take some questions? I think there's one here. Nisha. Do you mind just introducing yourself, though I know who you are? <laughs> okay. uh, good morning, uh, Madam Minister. My name is Agatha. I'm a publisher. Uh, the name of my publishing company is called The Can Do Company. Uh, one thing that we pride ourselves uh, uh, of is that our byline is we offer the finest fiction and nonfiction titles uh, from and for Africa and the rest of the world. A lot of the, the words that you used in your uh, 
eloquent speech uh, resonated uh, with me. Uh, things about you know uh, telling your story, uh, you know uh, presenting the, uh, a a uh, a much uh, more upbeat narrative about Africa, about specifically Rwanda to the rest of the world. So in in my mind right now, as I was listening to your speech, I was thinking, so how do we tell your story? For me, I'm, I'm very deliberate about really looking out for for uh, for. A, a body of literature within this region that you know I could uh, present to uh, to the markets that I uh, where I sell my ebooks. Uh, so I'm thinking, how does how, how do I connect? Uh, I, I came here deliberately to to seek out what are the business opportunities for me as a publisher, whereby I can now therefore also help in promoting the literature of your country. Because if anything else, I believe one of the best ways really to present. Uh, uh, a country to the world and to highlight the very best of what that country uh, represents is to really um, uh, put forth its uh, body of literature and I, that is what I would like to, uh, to know a, a bit more about and what can I do to help in developing that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you for wanting to tell a story that others don't want to tell and that is the story of Africans by Africans which to me is needed. I think as far as uh, Rwanda is concerned, uh, we can easily connect you with um, uh, people in your profession in, in Kigali, uh, aspiring publishers. Uh, the publishing industry is also one of the things that lags behind in Rwanda, but certainly Rwanda is not short of stories to tell. So what we can do practically is to uh, connect you with some people in Rwanda through our High Commission. Our high Commissioner is right here. And, uh, and, and of course, I personally welcome you to Rwanda uh, whenever you, you have time so that you can get, first of all, I think a feel of the people and, and, and get to talk to individuals uh, for publication. Thank you. Katrina, you've got a question? Nishif? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Madam Minister, audience, I'm Katrina Manson from the Financial Times. I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate on your, your metaphor of an indolent child begging for approval from a, from a stern but compassionate uh, set of Western governments. How have the recent delays or suspensions in, in budget support fed into that? What is the impact on your budget planning? As I understand, the flow of money is incredibly important to your economy, and we've seen in the last week, I think, a suspension, a small suspension from the Dutch, but also much larger military aid from, from the US, also nearly 40 million from the African Development Bank and 16 million pounds from, from the UK, which seems a particularly striking uh, uh, delay from your biggest bilateral donor. How does that metaphor fit with, with those delays in, in financing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the metaphor is very appropriate for the situation you just uh, described, but uh, you know, the, these uh, delays of uh, various um, sector and budget support for Rwanda have taken us by surprise because they are based on a report that is not really a report, uh, but again, that is not Rwanda's decision. Um, and, and there is plenty of contradiction also um, in, the, in the attitude. Um, on one hand, um, well, first of all, the, the confusion starts with the media because uh, there is such frenzy around this issue that it's difficult to sort out what is what. Um, uh, a number of these uh, delays were notified to the government of Rwanda a few weeks back. So to us, it's not news. Uh, but, but also uh, there's jumping from delays to cuts, uh, figures um, all mixed up. Uh, so that confusion itself needs to be uh, sorted out. Now, the, the metaphor is, 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 is very real in, in this situation. There is a UN report, and I want to talk about that report in a minute, that has allegations of uh, Rwanda supporting and, and, and fueling conflict in, in the DRC. These are allegations. Rwanda has not yet uh, given 
it comments on, on this report. So while we're in the middle of trying to understand and explain, a decision has been made already that Rwanda is guilty and these uh, different uh, uh, programs are going to be delayed and disbursement is you know, going to depend very much on what happens with... Um, so, so if you've decided uh, that Rwanda is, is guilty, um, then I guess the report doesn't matter and the rebuttal doesn't really matter. So that is the confusion I wanted to talk about. But if Rwanda or any other country in Africa is going to base its livelihood on flimsy reports, and I'll show you how flimsy it is, if African countries are going to depend for their livelihood on a decision made somewhere in the world that they have nothing to do with, then we're in big trouble. And what Rwanda has been uh, saying is that, first of all, aid has been very good to Rwanda. We have been able to rebuild our country thanks to aid. So we're not ungrateful, but it was also helpful because we have used it properly. And our goal as a country, our ambition as a nation, is to slowly use aid in a way that allows economic growth in our country so that eventually, uh, when the time comes, we get off of aid. Uh, because no nation can live without planning, with unpredictability. Um, no nation can depend on a newspaper article to be able to disperse money for health or electricity and so forth. So I think the, the, the metaphor is very real, you know, but, but what Rwanda has been saying is this uh, parent-to-child relationship has to end. Uh, on one hand, uh, countries call themselves our partners. On the other hand, they are dangling a check telling us to behave, and if you don't behave, I will withdraw the check. So it's it's... It's a very uh, precarious situation, and uh, right now it hasn't affected uh, Rwanda. It could, uh, but I'm confident that uh, as Rwanda has faced uh, uh, very, uh, very difficult situations in the past, Rwandans, the people of Rwanda, would have to deal with it. They will have to find solutions. Uh, we've been, we've been uh, in a much worse situation than than. Uh, than uh, some, uh, you know, dollars being withheld uh, from us. So I really think, uh, on a serious note, that first of all, there is no implication whatsoever of Rwanda and Eastern DRC. There isn't. Um, second, the international community, I think with the complicity of the DRC government, are running away from a mess they have created, and they have to find somebody responsible for that. The current crisis in the Eastern DRC started with the international community wanting to arrest some Congolese officer. The operation was botched, it was poorly planned, and defections started in the Congolese army. Now, how that becomes Rwanda's problem is what we've been trying to understand in the, last, in the last three months. But what is dangerous, which I touched on in my introduction, is these preconceived notions, this narrative that is already there, that you have Congolese of Rwandan descent, they form the majority of the mutiny, they are near Rwanda's border, which we didn't draw the borders, uh, so we're not responsible for people of Rwandan descent around our borders. Therefore, absolutely Rwanda must be helping, but we're not. But if you have that narrative, then you can go take pictures of fake uniforms, which is what's in the UN report. You can um, take photos of commercial radios for communication in the army, which we don't have. Our army doesn't use commercial radios for 
uh, its communication and put it in a report and say, I have proof. I'll tell you something that really uh, made me laugh yesterday. A journalist from the BBC calls me and said, Madam Minister, there is fresh evidence of Rwanda's involvement. Somebody from the United Nations just told me that they saw um, soldiers with clean uniforms speaking English in the DRC. So I said, are you listening to yourself? A clean uniform means that the Rwandan army is involved. If I were in the DRC and I heard somebody speaking English, I'd probably think of Uganda immediately because there is more English spoken in Uganda than in Rwanda. And in fact, Congolese soldiers have run into Uganda a few weeks ago. So I said, this is the kind of reports that you are basing yourselves on to find Rwanda guilty, that there was an iron and clean and nice looking uniform, therefore Rwanda is involved. Uh, this is actually, uh, I mean, it's, it's, if it wasn't causing uh, such hardship and, and, and difficulty for the populations of East, Eastern DRC, it would be really funny. I heard somebody speaking English in DRC, therefore Rwanda is involved. We, we've even had, and, and I want to talk about the importance of context for this whole DRC thing. If, if you are trying to understand the situation and you do not go to the context, you won't understand it. Because if you hear people speaking Kenya Rwanda in Eastern DRC, that's because there are Congolese who speak the language of Rwanda in DRC. So if you hear people speaking Swahili in Kigali, that's because Swahili is one of the languages spoken in Rwanda. If you pick and choose elements to justify your narrative of Rwandan Congolese in the army, therefore Rwanda is involved, this is what we are dealing with. There is absolutely zero evidence of Rwanda's involvement in destabilizing Congo. But again, there was an attempt to capture somebody for the International Criminal Court. Rwanda has not subscribed to the idea, to the goals, to the legal structure of the International Criminal Court. We have good reason. Rwanda has been maligned by European judges, French judges, Spanish judges, who wake up and indict Rwandan officials. And we feel that international justice is important for us. If anybody wants international justice, it's Rwanda. But it cannot be done uh, as a way for the West to scare and capture unwanted Africans. We have absolutely rejected the ICC from the beginning. And today we find ourselves justified. So don't drag Rwanda into an ICC operation in a foreign country. It, it, it's not right. And then if the operation fails, then you go to that country to find somebody who's guilty of your failure. This is exactly what we're dealing with. Let me give you another example of these uh, UN allegations that are going to cause Rwandans to uh, die of hunger. One of the um, accusations is on ammunition, ammunition that Rwanda would have uh, provided to the mutineers on the other side. And the report of the UN group of experts shows all kinds of photos of ammunition that must have come from Rwanda, nowhere else. These are ammunition that were disposed of in 2008 they are bulky, they are old, no modern army uses these things anymore. Um, and it so happens that one of the members of the group of experts, while they were in Kigali this past week, had been a witness to the destruction of these weapons as part of the regional small arms uh, mechanism. So when the group of experts, when we were discussing this issue, we brought 
documentary evidence of the destruction of these weapons in 2008. One of them was a witness uh, in his previous job with dates, specifics. So we asked them, where did you get this from? You know, and, and usually when you're an expert, you get to that point, you, you kind of don't want to say that you're not an expert. So how do you make a report with photos of ammunition supposedly coming from Rwanda when Rwanda doesn't have those. We don't have, we don't make weapons. We, we have no factory for ammunition. So everything that comes into Rwanda is imported, it's registered, it's written somewhere. One of the allegations uh, by the UN group of experts is about and this is really very, very disingenuous, is about some of our uh, army leadership being actively involved in recruiting for the rebellion across the border. Now, there is no secret. It's, it's out in the open. It's history. Rwanda is not responsible for the history of the region that many people in the Congolese army today, at some point, were part of the, uh, of the Rwandan army. They have worked together, they have fought, they have fought together. To this day, Rwanda has its troops in joint operations with the DRC, in the DRC. So you can imagine that there is war next door, you have joint operations, you've worked together over so many years, and so the group of experts uh, via the Congolese intelligence services provides a, a call log, a phone call log of uh, officers talking to the other side. Not only had the Congolese leadership, army leadership, asked the Rwandan army leadership to help to talk to those who are unhappy in the army, use your leverage, Please tell them. So our Rwandan leadership in the military did just that. They talked to them. They told them not to defect. And the, they turn around and say, the Rwandan leadership in the army is talking to the other side, asking them to, uh, to defect. But when you look at the, the phone calls, these are calls to the current uh, uh, M23 when they were still part of the Congolese army not when they were mutineers telling them look if you have grievances uh, we have sat down with you and the Congolese army leadership we want you to take your grievances and push them but there is no need to start fighting this is how disingenuous this report is and we are not making up anything the UN group of experts says we have tried everything to get the government of Rwanda to respond to these allegations. Then we, we receive no response. That is why this report is one-sided, which is not true. It is not true. They even say that they met with Rwanda's Minister of Foreign Affairs in New York, and they gave her a chance to provide a rebuttal of, of these allegations. Well, when I went to New York and Washington, I wasn't going to rebut the allegations against Rwanda. I'm not an expert. I have no idea what weapons Rwanda has. I don't even know until I look very carefully what our uniform looks like. So my purpose in New York was to conduct usual bilateral meetings and some UN meetings. I wasn't in New York to give the group of experts a rebuttal of the allegations. This is a meeting that where I call the coordinator to try and understand why a report is going to be published when Rwanda has not been consulted. So 30 minutes, a 30 minutes meeting, two hours before the report is presented to the Security Council, I was given a chance to rebut and I didn't. So there is a lot of bad faith uh, in this. But I think what's very important is that uh, which we have, Rwanda is very happy about, is that the region, uh, because it's the region that is affected, has gotten rid of, um, have, has gotten hold of uh, 
this issue uh, through the various meetings that took place in Addis Ababa two weeks ago. And as a region, we are trying to support Congo. But I think it's important that Congo uh, shows and acts as if it wants a solution. Because let's say Rwanda was guilty of everything that is in the UN group of experts and all kinds of aid is cut. Uh, by the way, Rwanda has, uh, since 1994, been able to move from 100% uh, budget support to above 50. So really, as hard as this uh, could be, uh, even on a wrong decision, I don't think Rwandans will starve. So, but my point is, My point is, if Rwanda is found guilty as charged by the UN group of experts, how is that bringing peace to Congo? We have now decided as a region that we will bring in a force to surveil the Rwandan border. Once that is in place, who's going to be blamed? You know, because this cross-border support that is alleged is not there, but let's bring a third party to sit at our border. Um, and if the situation doesn't get better in Congo, who's going to be blamed? And all these other uprisings in, in different parts of Congo. Uh, the city of Walikale was, uh, was uh, I think, overrun uh, last week, uh, a, few, a few days ago, a week ago. Uh, there is trouble in South Kivu. There is trouble in Ituri. Is now Rwanda going to be the country that is supporting five different ethnic groups in Congo? I mean, let's get serious. But um, um, the, to get back to, and, and, and finally on your question, it is very important for the international community, the different countries, um, wagging the finger and, and using reports that Rwanda has no say on, I think it's very important to understand that if, if we have to live in a civilized manner in this interlinked world, there has to be a minimum of respect. And we have to talk to each other as people who have respect uh, for one another. Uh, some of this aid that is being suspended has not even been delivered. The 200,000 that is going to train somebody in, uh, in, in our uh, uh, military academy, that is money Rwanda has not received. So it's been given and, you know, we've held, but we haven't seen it. Uh, so I think this kind of, again, parent to child, you know, if you don't behave, I'll take your candy away. I think we Africans must reject that. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Gabriel Negatu. I'm the uh, general director for East Africa, the African Development Bank, and my colleague here mentioned African Development Bank, so I wanted to set the record straight. But let me first thank the Honorable Minister for her very uh, illuminating uh, uh, presentation and uh, for the deliberately but effective provocation uh, that, uh, that she has put out. And I, I join her in, in, in thanking you and in saying, I think we need more of these, more of these kinds of uh, uh, dialogue uh, forums so that we all come to informed decisions and positions about any issue uh, rather than a uh, you know, one-sided event. But uh, uh, my colleague here pointed out that the African Development Bank has withheld uh, budget support. Uh, what the African Development Bank has done is, uh, due to some internal administrative processes, the uh, granting of the budget support was delayed by one week. But this had nothing to do with uh, so-called UN report that uh, we have not uh, looked at or are not 
are concerned with. Uh, we are a, a development institution and our decisions are made solely, solely on economic performance and on that basis there has been no issue uh, with the economic management issues in Rwanda but due to internal procedures on how we process our uh, our budget support operations in this case 40 million dollars it was delayed by one week so I wanted to set the record straight but uh, while I still have the mic let me just also comment on some of the things that the Honorable Minister said uh, you know, well, as Africans, as an African and perhaps working for a donor. child type of relationship. Now, uh, not being prejudicial to what is happening in the region, uh, we are in general concerned about the, the crisis in the region, the humanitarian issues and so on, but we are strongly also uh, committed to supporting the process that has started through the African Union. I think that has to be the best way to solve this problem. Not, uh, as she said, someone sitting in Brussels or New York uh, making noise, but Africans getting together and saying, yes, this is an issue, concerns all of us, and, and, and we solve it. So in that respect, we, we very much support the initiative that has started through the African Union. Uh, lastly, I, I am struck by something she said, uh, and I think something that should concern all of us. This is the issue of, uh, you know, uh, Rwandan, uh, Congolese of Rwandan origin uh, being treated as second class citizen in, in, in the DRC. Now, I, I have no information about that, but in principle, in principle, I think this is something that should concern all of us, whether it's in Rwanda, whether it's in DRC, whether it's in Kenya, any citizen, irrespective of their origin, or the ethnic background, when treated as second class citizen, I think we are all diminished, all of us. Whether we are Rwandese, Congolese, it doesn't matter. We are all diminished. And I think this is the issue that should be concerning us. Now, uh, of course, all of these conflicts are manifestations of a deeper problem. And uh, I'm surprised to learn the UN has been in that region for 30 years. 30 years. Uh, and to be writing reports after 30 years of stabilization, I, I think that it says something about the operation itself, but again, I'm not uh, knowledgeable about that, but just from a layman point of view, after 30 years, if you come to me with a report about a problem that you're supposed to have been solving, I will be looking at you and not at your report, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, but again, you know, I, 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 I don't know enough uh, about that region, but in principle, though, in principle, uh, I think we have learned, we have learned a lot in Rwanda uh, and genocides, the, the issue of Cote d'Ivoire, I lived in Cote d'Ivoire, the issue of Ivoirite, who is an Ivorian, and giving second class citizenship status to people whose grandparents were born in a given country because they have some roots to a neighboring country. When the borders were not even defined, I think is a cause for concern for all of us. and we should sort of look at the bigger issue and the issue of vision and dignity that she touched on. As Africans, I think all of us need to confront our past with dignity and chart the road ahead with dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the 
um, East African Regional Representative of the African Development Bank. Um, I used to work for the African Development Bank, so I, I'll be uh, not giving him compliments, but I think Gabriel made some really very relevant points. One is um, the clarification about what the African Development Bank is dispersing or delaying. This is what I meant by this whole media circus around what's going on, uh, withholding, cutting, delaying, 5 million euros, $10,000. Let's take a deep breath uh, and look at what's going on. And I think accuracy would help a lot, uh, particularly um, uh, in the media. Whatever amount it is, it is what this means. Uh, the the $200,000 for uh, training in a military academy really is is no big deal. But it's the gesture. It's, it's why you do this and, and, and why you think that Africans are like kids. You have to pressure them. You know, there are Rwanda phones in Congo. If we pressure the Rwandan president, therefore we would have peace in Congo. It's wrong. It's plain wrong. And the gesture itself, the thinking behind the gesture, and I think more outrageously, the idea that that's how Africans should be treated. I mean, this money given to our countries, we haven't worked for it. We don't maybe even deserve it. We don't know. So if you decide to feed me or cut the food, I haven't really worked for you. I, you know, you don't owe me anything. It's your decision. But we are saying the decision should be made on serious grounds. And this, the decision should be discussed. We're talking about countries. We're talking about entire structures. So how one civil servant in an office in Brussels or New York gets up and produces a, a news story or a report and that ends up being thought as something that is going to affect a whole African country, to me really doesn't make sense. And I think as, as a Rwandan uh, and with the recent history of my country, uh, and, and having lived for a long time in, in the West, there is a tendency to, and as I said, I'll be a bit more provocative than a diplomat should be, but there is a tendency to, to think that um, uh, Africans can be treated a certain way. I see it a lot in, 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 in my work, uh, with, uh, in my dealings with uh, various ambassadors representing you know, various countries, um, where if, if there is, you know, in, in the daily business of, of diplomacy, you have small issues, you know, people detained at airports, visas declined, and sometimes these things come all the way to us. So when you call an ambassador to get an explanation, the worry is not what you're going to ask them. The worry is that an African minister at all thinks that they could summon an ambassador to ask. So if you call an ambassador and say, look, I understand the citizens of this country that, you know, spent the night in your airport, you didn't want them to go to the hotel because typically an African in Europe is going to run away. There's such a great life in Europe. They're going to get off the plane and disappear. We're just trying to find an explanation. But in the minds of the average Western diplomat, I, I've been looking at this whole visa thing, and it's the height of humiliation. That you want to travel, <laughs> you are taking your money, you are flying on their plane, you are eating their food, reading their newspaper, and you have to be humiliated for that. In, in some countries, application for a visa for an African is like you've killed somebody. 
First of all, the look on the face of the visa officer. What, what is this African up to? How long will you be in my... What is the purpose of your travel? Well, I'm going for vacation. Vacation? Can, <laughs> vacation is in Africa. What are, what are you really going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. So, applying for a simple travel permission to go to the West and come back is torture for many Africans. And it is unacceptable. So let me tell you something that happened with Rwanda. In Rwanda today, you can apply for a visa online. You put in your particulars, you, the dates, everything, and you get a code, and you take that code, and when you come in, you are given a visa at, at the airport. Now, before we go to that system, and Obviously, in any post-conflict country, you want to make sure who's coming in the country and who's crossing the border and so forth. We wanted people coming to the country to give references, like who knows you in this country, which we do when we go to their countries. And you should have seen the outrage. I have to give references in Rwanda. It's like I'm doing you a favor coming to your country. Uh, but this is only one small, uh, uh, one small sign of this whole attitude. And what I have noticed, especially working in government and dealing with foreign uh, governments, when, when you ask what you should simply ask or when, when you refuse to be treated a certain way, it's interpreted as arrogance. These Africans are arrogant. I'm, at, I'm just asking a question. Why did you offload Rwandan citizens in your capital and keep them in an the airport? Why didn't you let them, you know, put them on a chain, take them to a hotel, but let them have a good night's sleep? And if you're asking that question, it is arrogance. How is that arrogant? So, and it links very much with what we talked about of I decide on your fate, I know who you are, I decide who you are, and you can't talk back. It is not acceptable. And I think as Rwandans, as East Africans, as Africans, the time has come to nicely and politely say, I matter, just as you matter. You have more. You might have more, you might have technology, you might have uh, better finances, though these days. <laughs> I tell you, you take the crisis that is going on in the West today, you bring it to Africa, we will be finished. There would be no talk of bailing anybody out, there would be all kinds of travel advisories, do not go to these countries. But we look at it and we think, uh, sometimes I think we Africans are too nice and too good. We look at it and, and, and you know, there's a lot of very serious corporate mistakes that were made, regulatory and others. And we start shaking, is, is this financial crisis going to reach us? Well, maybe, but we have to figure out a way to live with or without the financial crisis. So it's the thinking that I was trying to, to bring up in, in my introduction. Thank you. And then will you pass it to the ambassador after you? Hello. Uh, my name is Shege. Um, I'd like to thank you, though, Madam Minister, for a very eloquent presentation on uh, the situation in the DRC. I'd like to say that I too have suffered the indignity of a visa application and being detained at an airport because I was simply African, so I cannot leave the airport. But um, back to the situation at hand, uh, you said that the Congolese government has contacted you about using your leverage uh, with the M23 to calm down the situation. The question I'd like to know is what leverage do you have within Congo and with the M23? And more importantly, aside from the blame game, 
uh, on who's to blame, who's not to blame, what is uh, Rwanda's proposed solution for the DRC and the situation there? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll begin with the last question. Rwanda has no solution for Congo. Uh, Rwanda will be part of any solution from the region as we have done through the various consultations in the International Conference of the Great Lakes Region in the African Union. Uh, we, we will do whatever it takes for stability to come back in, 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 in the DRC, uh, but no solution should be expected from Rwanda. We, we have a small country to run. We can't run another big country next door. Uh, but what we have is a lot of goodwill to support a solution in Congo. But we can only support, we cannot create a solution. And the solution will be a decision of the Congolese authorities. What the Congolese authorities think will help bring back peace, will sustain a peaceful situation, especially in the East, Rwanda, like Uganda and Kenya and Burundi, all of us are in this larger Great Lakes uh, organization. We will support it fully. Um, in terms of leverage, um, l let me go back to uh, uh, just quickly to the history. Um, the, the current leadership in the DRC um, was at some point very closely connected with the Rwandan army leadership. Uh, the current president himself at some point uh, was with the Rwandan army. There's a whole history of how the region got rid of a man called Mobutu Sese Seko. That's, that's when the whole thing started. So our Rwanda's current minister of defense at some point was chief of defense of the Congolese army. Uh, in, in, in the immediate uh, removal of Mobutu. So people know each other. Officers know each other. They have worked with one another. But then also, in, 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 but also Rwanda has invaded Congo, pursuing the genocidal forces that had just killed a million people in Rwanda. Uh, so we have fought war with Congo. But importantly, we have made peace with Congo. So what we see in the thinking and in the writing of, of a number of people is that they are stuck in the history of 10, 15 years ago. But Congo and Rwanda have moved on. We have had a number of accords and, and, and reached agreements. We have lived very peacefully since 2009. And I think it's a mistake to take the history, which Rwanda is not responsible for, where, again, the international community played a very negative role, mix it all up to justify the current crisis. For as far as, as Rwanda knows, a mutiny is, is a very serious offense. But it's an act of indiscipline in an army. It does not need to bring you know, all kinds of United Nations gunships and, you know, create all kinds of chaos when it's something that could have been stopped in the first place. Uh, you know, there was a missed opportunity. There's no question about it. When a mutiny starts, you try to address it. Uh, now, Rwanda's position has been from the beginning that you cannot fix this with a military solution for a number of reasons. Um, but Congo being a sovereign country, they have decided to do it the military way. It's not working. So it's up to Congo to decide what to do. We, we can't really make decisions for Congo, but we will support that. So the leverage is there. There is um, relationship from the top level of the leadership of Congo all the way to the uh, officers. The uh, current mutiny in Congo is not the only one. 
whether you call it mutiny or discontent or uprising or what we have been reading in the news and what we know from uh, following closely the region is that there are many, many groups now in different parts of, of the DRC and that is an issue that needs to be addressed. So while this current crisis needs to end and Rwanda will do everything that is asked of Rwanda to make sure that happens, we cannot go back and sit and wait for an M24 or an M25. And we are very, very interested in discussing the underlying causes of this cyclical instability. You see, because we've been there before. That's where we were in 2008. And what Rwanda did in 2009, uh, when one of the Congolese generals who was fighting his own army fled to Rwanda, we captured him. We are detaining this man illegally. In fact, I'm always amazed that these various human rights groups are not asking about a general that is detained illegally in Rwanda. I, I always wonder about that. You know, Rwanda is detaining a Congolese general illegally. But we did it at our own political expense because these are people who have constituencies. We did it to give peace a chance in Congo. We don't need it. He's Congolese. He's, you know, whatever language he speaks, whomever he looks like, he's Congolese. But we did it hoping that that would then allow discussions uh, at the time of the previous mutiny, which, you know, it, it was backed by a political organization, that the Congolese would sort out their problems. So what we see now, especially in the international community, is a feeling that Rwanda is going to be the jail of Congolese opponents, that we, we must detain anybody who's being troublesome in Congo. It doesn't work like that. So we do know people. We, we have worked with them. Um, and if we have to do anything at all, because Rwanda needs peace as much as Congo does, it's right on our border. We, we are a country that um, is at peace. We are moving forward economically. We want stability. We are integrating in East Africa. We don't need trouble. So whatever we can do, we will do it. And we will use the, the, the whatever moral leverage or whatever we, we have in our capacity. But the problem has not even been defined properly yet. But we are ready as a country and... Uh, you know, with a lot of history with Congo to do what we can to, um, to support a, a, a peaceful solution in Congo. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Tooth. I'm Australia's High Commissioner to Kenya, but also Australia's High Commissioner to Rwanda, of which I'm extremely proud. And Minister, thank you today and for coming today. And I urge you to take every opportunity to summon me to, to Rwanda as I... I'm always looking for excuses to go to your beautiful country. We have no visa problems with Australia. <laughs> I'm going to have my, I might have to make some up. Um, Minister, a point and then a question. The point is, um, let me congratulate you for embracing this forum and for embracing new ways and new forms of uh, communication, like Twittering, like Facebook. And that uh, extends to the Rwandan government. The world is opening and the world is waking up to the potential of Africa, and it would wake up much faster, and much, much faster, if, if other countries followed Rwanda's example, and I, you should be congratulated for that. Um, and secondly, the question. Um, you quoted a number of statistics, proudly about Rwanda's recent performance, one that constantly amazes us in Australia, mainly because we haven't been able to achieve as much in this area. Um, is the participation of women in politics and in business and in other for areas and other forms. It's well over 50% of um, Rwandan politicians are women, and I think around half the cabinet are women. And uh, that level of participation extends across Rwandan society as far as we can see. Um, how have you managed to do that? Um, that is an extraordinary achievement, um, something that the whole world is supposedly aiming to do. Um, Australia is struggling to get those sort of numbers um, and other countries of, the, of, a, of a similar um, size and uh, history are struggling. We, we find it, it, there are a number of aspects to it, of course. There's the, uh, the glass ceiling that is often commented on. There's the, uh, 
Um, how do you motivate women to enter the really tough, hard world of politics? And any insights you have on that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, High Commissioner. Uh, I, I'm going to sit here so I can see you. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, well, there is a reality, I think, especially in Africa, all over this continent when you travel, you, you realize that African women are very hardworking, very, very hardworking. Um, there is also another reality, and we have seen it in Rwanda as we evaluate our performance vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Millennium Development Goals, and that is that women are very connected to the entire development process. When you look at the different MDGs, it is not conceivable for us that one would exclude the, the, the contribution of women to development, whether it's nutrition, whether it's clean water, whether it's maternal health, child education, you name it. Any of these MDGs are very, very much connected to the role that the woman plays in the, in the household, but also in, in society. So, um, uh, but again, this, this kind of show is an opportunity to be a bit informal. I think it's also true that when you look at many countries, everything is on the books. The constitution, the, 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 the regional uh, quotas and all that, and there is not a single country in Africa that in the book says we should push aside women. But the reality of it is that um, men sometimes use culture as an excuse to exclude women, isn't it? You know, there are all kinds of apparently old practices in Rwanda about women that really don't make sense. Like Rwandese women should not eat goat. <laughs> or, you know, a woman cannot get into construction because she has to climb up the, the roof. In the first case, I think men wanted to have more to eat. In the second case, I think they were fighting for a job. So, how Rwanda did it, a number of, of ways, but one is, is to, to confront all these taboos and these cultural um, posturings that, that really don't make any sense. Uh, because you have a very active force in your economy, you have a very active force socially. As a politician, it doesn't make sense to exclude uh, that vital force in, 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 your, in your society. Now, what has <coughs> happened with Rwanda also, uh, and perhaps linked to that, you know, men's attitude and, and the excuse of culture, is that, very frankly, a lot of Rwandan men have acknowledged and appreciated the role that women in our country have played, especially in the entire reconstruction process. And I think that has brought a lot of admiration um, and has allowed men to make a little bit of space for women to, to participate in, in, in the national life, both in the decision-making process, but also in, in society at large. We have also um, thought it was important, instead of starting with men, <coughs> starting with boys, in the education system, uh, get rid of prejudice against girls, have girls study science uh, alongside boys and not just think that girls should study uh, social uh, affairs and, and, and eventually become teachers and, and ministers of gender. And the, We have tried to move away from those um, that 
traditionally male domain in our culture and in our politics. Um, and I think finally and importantly, I think the, the leadership of the country, uh, President Kagame has been wonderful with women. He has uh, led by example the entire liberation struggle that he led included women at different levels, including in the fighting, in the finances, um, in, in decision making at the highest level. But, but also uh, the leadership of the country beyond the president himself has um, allowed for, uh, for example, uh, our chief of police for many years until very recently was a woman. Uh, because we need to change perceptions uh, the first mayor of Kigali, right after the genocide, was a woman. Um, uh, the, the deputy in the central bank for a number of years was a woman. So by allowing young men and boys to see and to get accustomed to women performing in different fields and, and succeeding, I think, has contributed a lot and, and, become, and become an incentive. But I will not take away the legislation because you cannot simply count on the goodwill of, in, in society. So we have gone into our laws and made them uh, women friendly. Inheritance laws, for example, for a long time, a Rwandan woman could not inherit. The brother would inherit and not the, the sister. We've changed all that. Uh, we, we have uh, also punished very severely with, with a lot of support from both male and female legislators, um, uh, gender discrimination, sexual-based violence is severely punished in Rwanda. So there is the vision, there is the belief that women can do it, there is the legislation, and there is also at the social and cultural level giving more value to, uh, to women. And, and for Rwanda, uh, it, it's been a very, very good uh, experience and 56% in parliament and 40% and in cabinet and all that would not be enough if we did not have women at the grassroots uh, doing what um, uh, women should be doing, which is to be part of, of building and sustaining society. Uh, so it's a, number of, it's a number of measures, but it all begins by understanding the value that women bring to the development process, to understand that men and women can work together, uh, they complement each other, they don't need to be fighting with one another, but also to confront our own culture and our own history and, and allow the, the, the all forces in our society to contribute uh, positively. Good morning. Uh, on this uh, other side. Oh, can I just take a couple, then I'll come back. Yes. Uh, my name is Samuel Bogwa. I work in aviation. And uh, thank you, Madam Minister, for a very spirited uh, presentation. And I have two questions. You made reference to the Rwandan Development Plan, uh, Vision 2020. I'd be interested in finding out how is that vision being sold to the, uh, the implementation of that particular vision? How well does it actually trickle down to the individual citizens, how they participate within the entire vision. The second question, again, and this is, goes back to uh, my area of expertise, which is the aviation industry. Um, you have, I think, Rwanda is your flag carrier. Or, yes. So, um, what, how, how, is the, how does the government support the aviation industry, especially considering that there's been a lot of competition coming in? There are a lot of people, a lot of players looking to make inroads. So how do you kind of protect what you have now and help it grow, you know, originally and internationally? Thank you very much. Um, um, you know, foreign ministers get asked all kinds of questions about everything in the countries. And um, most of my knowledge on aviation is about being on the plane all the time. <laughs> but... Um, uh, Rwanda Air is, is a new uh, national carrier 
Um, what I know is that aviation is, is very technical, very um, high-end and very complicated and costly uh, business. So what we have done with our, our new carrier is, is to, first of all, get expertise that Rwanda doesn't have. We have uh, looked to the region and, 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 and further to find expertise in different areas of, of aviation, and including Kenya and Ethiopia, for example, in our region. But also we've looked for engineers, um, pilots, um, you know, managers of different aspects of aviation, and team them up with our own uh, local people to learn uh, on the job. That was uh, critical. Now, what, what, what I know uh, just from my own experience is that uh, Rwanda is, is, uh, is a new and young uh, airline, but it's growing very rapidly, um, mostly because there is a lot of travel in the region and in Africa. Uh, what happens typically when people start an airline is, is to say you will never be able to, to get uh, passengers. But I've noticed, for example, on, on my travel to Asia, going through the Middle East, that there are a lot of Nigerians flying from Kigali. And, you know, Nigerians are very noticeable on the plane. <laughs> so um, I started wondering how Nigerians were in Kigali going to Dubai. <clears throat> and I realized that they fly from Abuja on Rwanda to Kigali because the, the schedule is convenient, and from Kigali, and I think uh, in terms of ticket price also, um, it's cheaper to go from west to east and from there go uh, different uh, directions. Um, so besides that, I think it's also attracting uh, connections, networks. So Rwanda has been negotiating over the last two and a half years a number of airlines to, to come to Kigali. <clears throat> so it's been very useful to Rwanda Air, for example, as, as a new airline, to have um, this network um, through Kigali. We have now Turkish Airlines, Istanbul Kigali, we have Qatar Airways, Doha Kigali, uh, of course, a few flights of Kenya Airways every day and, and Ethiopian Airlines, South Africa Airways, uh, Brussels Air, uh, KLM. And that has allowed the, these other airlines to pick up passengers from Kigali and Rwanda Air to do the sort of regional uh, collection and allow for passengers to go onto these bigger airlines. So there is... Uh, there is um, I think a lot of um, connection study uh, that has helped Rwanda Air to, to start growing. Um, it's also uh, important to note that some parts of Africa are very, very difficult to travel to. Um, and you can imagine for, so Rwanda Air now flies to Congo Brazzaville, uh, flies to Libreville, Gabon, and these are parts of Central Africa that you know, even though the, the classic Kenya Airways and Ethiopian Airlines fly there, uh, sometimes the connections are very difficult. And if you miss your flight, you could wait a day and a half before you get the next one. Or, typically, you reach a destination that is near your final destination, which is 30 minutes, 20 minutes away, and you have to wait seven hours to get the connection that takes you half an hour away, especially Central and West Africa. So uh, part of Rwanda Air's ambition is to look at these spots that have been left in the middle and find a way to link up with these major airlines like we're working with Turkish Airlines, for example, to, to kind of go to these parts of Africa where there's not a lot of traffic. And, and I think once the company starts growing and the um, technical expertise that we're trying to build and, and also, uh, you know, frankly, in the spirit of integration, work very closely uh, through various 
existing um, air transport agreements with uh, the, the companies in, in, in the neighborhood, Air Uganda, Kenya Airways, um, Ethiopian, which is not very far from, from, from Kigali, and work together to connect the, the, the region, but also try to go uh, further um, on the continent. Vision 2020. There is something that um, Rwanda, I think, has done uh, out of necessity uh, after the genocide, and that was to conduct intense discussions amongst ourselves. Our leaders uh, back in the 90s, right after the genocide, used to spend sleepless nights, weekends, uh, talking about the very difficult issues that the country was faced with. That is how uh, Rwanda came up with the Gachacha, the community uh, justice system that we just uh, ended uh, a couple months ago. Because we were faced with so many suspects. Uh, because as you know, Rwanda's, uh, the particularity of Rwanda's genocide is that so many ordinary people were involved. But if you stop the genocide, you cannot take the entire country to jail. So what do you do about it? We've had very, very difficult decisions. And as a result, got into uh, this approach of talking. Let's debate. What can we do about this? And the debate went all the way to the villages to kind of be part of, of, of these solutions. And it has helped us a lot, particularly in our development process and picking some of the programs. So between 1998 and 2000, for a period of two years, Rwandans were engaged in finding, discussing a way forward in terms of development. What do we do with this country? How do we move to the long term? How do we lift the poorest of the poor out of poverty? So that exercise has been very important. And what we have done with that exercise is actually to constitutionalize it. We have made national dialogue in Rwanda a constitutional obligation. Every year, at the end of the year, all levels of uh, society, from the head of state all the way to the teacher, we all sit in our parliament house for three days, and we conduct what is known in Rwanda as umushikirano, getting together. And that national dialogue is now part of our law. Every year we get together and we talk about what we have done, what has worked, what the impediments have been, and take some decisions from that intense discussion and feed them into our various uh, um, action plans for ministries, for parastatal agencies and, and even the private sector. So Vision 2020 came as a result of this general discussion of all Rwandans. The moment the country became stable, it became important to sit and discuss development. How do we get as many Rwandans as possible out of poverty? We looked at um, agriculture, we looked at justice, we looked at energy, we looked at infrastructure, we looked at habitat, housing, all sectors um, of life in our society. And that resulted in that Vision 2020. Then from the document itself, we went into every sector, foreign affairs, economic sector, trade, and gave specific uh, milestones for each sector to achieve by a certain time and we also included evaluation processes and that's how we came up with the, um, uh, these various re poverty reduction programs that run a certain number of years and the latest evaluation of our vision 2020 through the poverty reduction um, um, area is, is the one that has statistically shown that a million Rwandans were lifted out of poverty over a, a, a certain number of years. We are now embracing the second part of our, our poverty reduction program, which runs from 2012 to 2017. 
So each one of us in our different sectors have um, a number of milestones, achievements, and we measure as we go, both at the level of the leadership, which is then another annual gathering of leadership, the National Leadership Retreat, which takes about 300 leaders from the head of state, speakers of uh, the two chambers of parliament, um, ministers, uh, permanent secretaries, I think some heads of uh, parastatal agencies, and we look at how to do better than we did the year before, and it's a regular exercise. So it's very, very systematic. Our ministry in charge of local government, which deals with, um, um, you know, municipal entities, uh, sectors, districts, has its own development plan that it evaluates on a regular basis when necessary adjusts the, 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 the plan, all the goals, or even brings in a more ambitious plan. Um, and that goes all the way to the average uh, person. In my own uh, domain, for example, which um, doesn't look like it touches the grassroots, it very much does, because in our um, national policy, foreign affairs policy, we, we go all the way to um, uh, community diplomacy. So for example, near in the districts and the provinces bordering our, our neighbors, uh, DRC, for example, the district of Rubavu and Goma in Eastern DRC have a certain relationship. And my ministry, along with the um, departments of migration and security and police and um, trade, we measure how neighboring communities uh, on the Rwandan side and on the DRC side are working together. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, can recommend to the Migration Department to simplify um, travel documents just for the neighborhood, for the people on the other side of the border that are coming into the country, both for good neighborly relations, but also for trade facilitation, cross-border facilitation, and at the end of now every six months, but at, at least at the end of every year, every single ministry, every single department pledges what they are going to do for the following year. Uh, it's called Imihigo. Every one of us has a performance contract, and we measure our performance contract according to those targets that we set at the beginning of the year. So that's how Vision 2020 comes down from the decision makers all the way to uh, the average person. And there are specific programs, for example, in uh, poverty, in the poverty reduction uh, program. And what has worked very well for Rwanda is we have introduced, again, after very wide discussion, homegrown solutions. Uh, practices that we had in the old day that were used by our great great grandparents, modernized them a bit, injected a bit of law, a bit of modern finance, and used them for our communities in, in the villages. So for example, in our uh, poverty reduction program, we have um, an initiative called Ubudehe. And Ubudehe in our system in the old day was community solidarity, people helping one another. If I'm building a house, my neighbors would come and help me with the bricks or, 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 uh, or the, the, those who knew a bit of carpentry would, would help. Um, so what we took is, is these systems that resonate with the average Rwandan put in um, a bit of World Bank money, put in a bit of government budget money, but especially put in a lot of ownership at the, at the grassroots level, owning the development process. So it's, it's 
it's gradual, sometimes it's slow, but it has, uh, it has very much uh, delivered for us. So through these various processes, including those that we have made part of our legal system, we have taken this vision, economic vision, of, um, of a middle income country. Uh, vision 2020 um, is a concept for Rwanda becoming a middle income country in 2020. And taken this document, broken it down, put it in different sectors, established measurements mechanisms, and we evaluate as we go. Um, obviously, it would not work if it remained just at the level of, uh, of uh, lawmakers and ministers and so forth. So every single domain goes all the way to, to the citizen. I'm going to ask the final question because uh, <laughs> I've got lots of people asking me, are you going to go for presidency in Rwanda? because they're so impressed with you on Twitter. <laughs> so I thought I had to share that. I don't think those people know how hard it is to be foreign minister. <laughs> no, because I think they I, I cannot so. imagine how difficult it is to be... I think it's because they feel you're so accomplished that they're asking you. Well, let's, let's do foreign affairs for now. <laughs> <laughs> My it's, it's a very difficult job. Yeah. Um, I, I cannot, I keep wondering how the president of Rwanda does it. It's a very difficult job. Yeah. And you have to be ready not to be popular. And President Kagame is a man who does not mind not being popular. So I don't know how that fits in the electoral process. But I know a lot of Rwandans have appreciated him for, for, for that. And... Um, so right now we are trying to deal with the current uh, foreign affairs uh, issues and it's a tough job I, I, I would say I'm, I'm not I don't think I would be able to do that job so let me try to deal with the one I have now Madam Foreign Minister thank you so much it was really a remarkably candid very articulate uh, uh, presentation that you've made here we're grateful that you took the time to come and spend it with us in Nairobi and explain the position of the Rwanda government, which I felt was not being explained. Uh, uh, and I think it, you gave a very articulate uh, position there. Um, I kindly request that maybe you can stay around for a little bit. Uh, I'd like to do a one-on-one -on -one interview on the live feed. And I'm sure there are lots of other people who would be keen to meet you. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh.